The Library Channel is proud to present the second Simon Ortiz Labriola Center Lecture on Indigenous Land, Culture, and Community, sponsored by the ASU American Indian Studies Program, ASU Department of English, ASU American Indian Policy Institute, ASU Labriola Center, and the Heard Museum. Recorded on October 2, 2008 at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Wilma Mankiller, former Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation and internationally known Native rights activist, talks about challenges facing 21st century Indigenous people. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. We're honored to have with us tonight one of the truly great leaders of um, the American Indian communities in America, Wilmer Mankiller, whose uh, credentials Simon Ortiz will talk about, so I won't. Um, this is an event that is sponsored um, in conjunction with Arizona State University and the Heard Museum. And um, there are so many different entities that are sponsoring this event that I, I must return to my notes. ASU's Department of English, the American Studies Programs, the American Indian Policy Institute, the Labriola National American Indian Data Center, the Department of History, and the Women and Gender Study Program in, uh, in and the Wonder, and the Women and Gender Study Program. Um, this program tonight is the second uh, in a series of programs that have been sponsored by the Simon Ortiz and Labriola S Center Lecture on Indigenous Land, Culture, and Community. And it's my understanding that these lectures are intended to address topics in the arts, humanities, sciences, and politics um, from the experiences and perspectives of American Indians. Um, we are really thrilled that you are here tonight to share um, this evening with us. Um, the herd is pleased to play a small part uh, in tonight's program. And before Simon Ortiz comes and introduces the speaker, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, to Wayne Mitchell. Wayne is a member of the Heard Museum's Board of Trustees. Um, he is also the chair of the American Indian Advisory Committee, which guides this institution on issues that relate to um, American, American Indian arts and culture. And Wayne has been a great, great supporter of this museum and a great help to me and to our staff. So, um, Wayne, I'd like you to come to the podium. Thank you. Well, I just want to take a minute to say thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. You know, we're in competition with uh, a debate, and uh, so we're glad that uh, all of you decided to come here, and, and uh, I guess some of you put the, um, uh, uh, the recorder on your TV set, because we don't want to miss that debate, do we? Uh, we're very excited to have Wilma Mankiller here. Uh, I'm just thrilled. Um, you know, w Wilma is a woman of, of um, destiny. This woman has done so much to bridge the gap between Indian communities and non-Indian communities. She's a woman uh, who has reached out to um, society and has achieved so much in uh, our lifetime. We are just honored to have her here, and I'm honored to be a part of this um, event to bring her here. The Heard Museum wants to do more in collaboration with Arizona State University. Uh, ASU used to be in Tempe. 
Now it's downtown, so I can see us doing lots of things together. And we want to make sure that all of you come back to the herd, not just for, for events like this, but come back anytime to tour our wonderful museum. Take part in our activities. We do a lot of things with the community, and we want you to feel comfortable and to be a part of what we're doing here. So we thank you very much for coming this evening. And Wilma, we thank you for being here. It's just an honor to have you. So thank you. Go on, see. Kaitawa haupa chutraea shapaka. Hello, and how are you this evening? Well, that's good. Ekoshe, ekoshe, eme e zist iu namatsifuno. Because that is what we all wish for. For it to be good during the day, during the night. And every moment in our lives, because the grandmothers and grandfathers of all our people, all those people who lived in the past before us, in the generations that are before us, have wished us to have good lives. And we are to be thankful for that. And I wish all of us, all of you, to have goodness. My name is Hitrutsi, M.A. Nuyu Taashia, the Zen in Ia, Ako Mesta Zen in Ia, M.A. Este. My name is Hitrutsi in my Akuma Pueblo language. That's what I am called. I am of the Jami Hano or Eagle people, and I am a son of or child of the antelope, Kotsi Washti Sutta. That is who I am. I'm, of course, Simon Ortiz, a member of the Aku Mehano, Akuma people in New Mexico, and I'm a professor in the English department uh, and also of the American Indian, American Indian Studies program at ASU. I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight to share with us a, a I think, very special occasion that will be, that will be uh, spoken in a talk by our guest, who is uh, a Cherokee person, a Native or Indigenous woman, American Indian, Native American person, who has meant so much to all of us because of what she has offered of her time, for the benefit of the land and culture and community that we all share here in this part of the world, as well as the whole of the United States and the whole, really, of this hemisphere, North, Central, and South America. So we are to be honored and, of course, thankful for what our guest, Wilma Mankiller, is sharing with us tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Miss Mankiller. Wilma Mankiller served for two years as the first female elected deputy chief, and then for 10 years as the first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. In her tenure as chief, her areas of expertise included governance, community development, and the conceptualization and development of an extensive array of projects ranging from basic infra infrastructure and enterprises to health clinics and programs for children and youth. 
She has served and serves on the Board of Trustees of the Freedom Forum and the Board of Directors of the Museum, a news organization in Washington, D.C. And she also serves as an external diversity advisor to Merrill Lynch. Wilma was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, the International Women's Hall of Fame, the Minority Business Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame, and the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. And yes, to repeat, she has 18 honorary doctorates from universities, including Yale, Dartmouth, and Smith Colleges. She was a Chubb Fellow at Yale and a Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth. And she has served as the Morse Chair Professor of Law and Politics at the University of Oregon uh, in the fall of 2005. She has presented more than 100 lectures at universities and, and has published more than a dozen papers in journals and newspapers. And then she is one of a handful of Native American recipients of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which was uh, concurred upon her by President Clinton. And then she's an author as well. She co-edited a Reader's Companion to the History of Women in the U.S., published by Houghton Mifflin. And then she is the author of Man Killer, A Chief and Her People, published by St. Martin's Press. And her newest book, Every Day is a Good Day, was published by the Fulcom Press in the fall of 2004. And those books are available for signing and sale, of course, out in the hall after the speaking event. Ms. Mankiller lives in the Cherokee Nation in rural, northeast rural Oklahoma with her husband, Charlie Soap. And then I want to tell you just a little bit personally that woman I met when I first went out to California in the mid 19 70s, 1975. As we know, San Francisco Bay Area was one of those relocation places that native people, indigenous people of the Americas, were sent to on a federal government program called relocation, when it was uh, intended that uh, native people, indigenous people, be assimilated and become Americanized or become part of the American metropolitan or urban areas. I met uh, Wilma when I moved out to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, area, not necessarily because I was on a relocation program, but because I, I was living out there in the mid-1970s. And about that time, Wilma was making her way back to back to Oklahoma, where she began by going home to live the life that had always been intended for her as a indigenous, as a native person. And we are very fortunate to be able to hear her talk tonight. And I'm glad that uh, she had the time and the generosity to be with us tonight. So please, all of us, welcome Wilma Mankiller. Let me begin by thanking all of you who came out tonight. I know it was a difficult decision. Sarah Palin, Wilma Mankiller. Sarah Palin, <laughs> Wilma Mankiller. What should we do tonight? So anyway, I, uh, but seriously, uh, I always feel like it's such an honor that people will leave their homes and 
the other activities in their lives and take the time to share a little time with me. And I want to personally thank each of you for, for coming tonight. And I also want to thank the Heard Museum for sponsoring this event. It's a beautiful facility, a welcoming facility, and a place where Indian people can feel at home. And uh, also thank them for the wonderful reception earlier. And uh, also thank ASU and all the nice people I met there today, and especially thank Simon Ortiz. As he noted, I've known Simon for well, this is how long ago it was. He had black hair and I was skinny. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Anyway, I wanted, wanted to thank him for uh, inviting me and being such a good host for me today. So this museum, I think, is just a terrific place. It houses one of the greatest collections of Indian art and artifacts anywhere in the world. And some of the people I talked with earlier who are connected with the museum, really impressed me with their commitment to partner with tribal people and to, on a number of projects, creative projects that will help encourage tribal people to continue to tell their own stories uh, in their own way, in their own voice. So I congratulate you on all your good work. And it's always great to be in Arizona. And I love Arizona. If I had to live any place other than in the Cherokee Nation, I'd live in Arizona. There's such a long history of indigenous people in the land here, and the, this land that's now called Arizona, that you can feel it when you're here. And it's, as most of you know, Arizona is now presently home to 20 tribal governments. And um, each of the tribal governments is not only working to improve the education, economic, and social conditions, of their people. They have also engaged in cooperative agreements and partnerships with their neighbors on environmental, health, education, law enforcement, and other issues. The history, contemporary lives, and future of Native people in Arizona and in the rest of North America is intertwined with that of surrounding communities. Tribal governments and organizations do not conduct their work in a vacuum. There are hundreds of partnerships and coalitions between native and non-native governments and organizations. When tribal governments build roads, water systems, develop business enterprises, or provide an array of family services, it benefits everybody in the community. The economic impact of tribal governments and businesses on the state of Arizona is enormous. Many of the tribal governments in Arizona have also led the fight for land rights and treaty rights. And I'm particularly um, interested in the, the Gila River's uh, historic uh, water settlement in 2004, which came about, only came about after decades of protracted litigation. The Gila River people uh, really have an inspiring story to tell because they the, the water is the lifeblood of their people and their land and their homeland. And they never, ever gave up the fight for their water rights. And uh, they were successful. And in the Indian water rights uh, world, the Gila River water settlement is an example for all tribal people. Let me say that I don't speak for all indigenous people or even all Cherokee people. The thoughts that I want to share with you tonight are derived entirely from my own experience. Most of my remarks tonight will concern indigenous people of North America, though I've had the privilege of visiting indigenous communities in China, in Ecuador, South Africa, New Zealand, as well as Brazil. There are over 300 million indigenous people in virt virtually every region of the world including the Sami peoples of Scandinavia, the Maya of Guatemala, numerous tribal groups in the Amaz Amazonian rainforest, the Dalits in the mountains of southern in India, the San and Kwe in southern Africa, Aboriginal people in Australia, and of course the hundreds of indigenous people scattered throughout Mexico, Central, and South America, as well as, as on this land, that's now known as North America. 
There is enormous diversity among communities of indigenous people, each of which has its own distinct culture, language, history, and unique way of life. Indigenous people, however, do share some com common values derived from an understanding, a deep understanding among the more traditional people that their lives are part of and inseparable from the nat natural world. Onondaga faith keeper Oren Lyons once said, our knowledge is profound and comes from living in one place for untold generations. Our knowledge comes from watching the sun rise in the east and set in the west from the same place over great sections of time. We are as familiar with the land, river, and great seas that surround us as we are with the faces of our mothers. Indeed, we call the earth Itinoha, our mother, from whence all life springs. This deeply felt sense of interdependence with all other living things fuels a duty and a responsibility to conserve and protect the natural world that is the sacred provider of food, of medicine, and spiritual sustenance. Hundreds of seasonal ceremonies are regularly conducted by indigenous people to express thanksgiving for the gifts of nature, to acknowledge seasonal changes, and to remind people of their obligations to each other and to the land. In many indigenous communities, traditional stories embody the collective memory of the people. These stories often describe how things were in the distant past, what happened to cause the world to be as it is today, and some stories project far into the future. The prophecies of many indigenous groups predict that the world will end when the people are no longer capable of protecting nature or restoring its balance. Two of the most widely quoted prophecies are those of the Hopi and Iroquois, both of which have long predicted that the world will end if human beings forget their responsibilities to the natural world. These pro prophecies seem particularly appropriate in this era of increasing alarm about the catastrophic effects of climate change and even some scientists questioning the, uh, the, the long-term survival, the prospects for long-term survival of humankind. Indigenous people are not the only people in the world who understand their connection to the earth and their interconnection with all living things. Former U.S. President, Vice President Al Gore said, at some point during this journey, we lost our feeling of connectedness to the rest of nature. We now dare to wonder, are we so unique and powerful, we humans, as to be essentially separate from the earth? Besides Vice President Gore, there are many thousands of people from different ethnic groups who care deeply about the environment and fight every day to protect the earth. The difference between non-indigenous people and indigenous people who are, who are engaged in that fight is that indigenous people have the benefit of being regularly reminded of their responsibilities to the land by the stories and by ceremonies. That's the difference. They remain close to the land, not only in the way they live, but in their hearts and in the way they view the world. Protecting the environment is not an intellectual exercise, it's a sacred duty. When women like Pauline Whitesinger, an elder at Big Mountain, and Carrie Dan, a Western Shoshone land rights activist, speak of preserving the land for future generations, they're not just talking about future generations of humans. They're talking um, about future generations of all living things, about the future generations of plants and animals. Pauline and Carrie understand in, in, a, in a very deep and abiding way the relative insignificance of human beings in the totality of the planet. When all human beings live closer to the land, no matter what their ethnic background, there was a greater understanding of the interdependence between humans and the land. Author and feminist Gloria Steinem observes that once, 
indeed for nearly all the time that human beings have walked this earth, you and I would have been living very differently in small bands, raising our children together as if each child were our own and migrating with the seasons. There were no nations, no lines drawn in the sand. Instead, there were migratory paths and watering places with trade and culture blossoming wherever the paths came together in patterns that spread across the continents like lace. Again, for non-Indigenous non people, in the absence of stories and ceremonies to remind them, many people have no memory of that time. They have no stories of that time. They have no ceremonies to remind them of that time. So they become distant from the land and from themselves and possess little understanding of their place in the world. Not too long ago, I was on a busy New York City street at a real magical time, which is the, is the uh, time just before the sun goes down at dusk. And it was interesting to watch the crowd because not a single person in the crowd looked over the Hudson River and watched the beautiful sunset or even seemed to acknowledge the fact that that they had just experienced the gift of an incredible day and, and uh, what a uh, an incredible gift that was. And it, it made me wonder how many millions of urban dwellers go out about their lives without ever really seeing or thinking about the, just the miracle of the natural world, the miracles of the natural world, or even of the sun rising in the morning and setting again in the evening. Aside from a, from a different view of their relationship to the natural world, Many of the world's indigenous people also share a sometimes fragmented, but still very present sense of responsibility for one another. Cooperation has always been necessary for the survival of tribal people, and even today, cooperation takes precedence over competition in more traditional communities. It's really quite miraculous that a sense of sharing and reciprocity continues in our communities into the 21st century, given the, given the staggering amount of adversity indige, indigenous people have faced. Within many communities, the most respected people are not those who have amassed great material wealth or achieved great personal success. The greatest respect is reserved for those who help other people, those who understand that their lives play themselves out within a set of reciprocal relationships. There is evidence of this sense of reciprocity in Cherokee communities. My husband, Charlie Soap, leads a widespread self-help movement among the Cherokee in which low-income volunteers work together to build walking trails, community centers, sports complexes, water lines, and houses. The self-help movement taps into the traditional value of cooperation for the sake of the common good. Besides sharing connection to the land and a sense of interdependence and values, the world's indigenous people are, are also bound by the common experience of being, quote, discovered, unquote, and subjected to colonial expansion into their territories that led to an incalculable loss, the loss of an incalculable number of lives and millions and millions of acres of land. The most basic rights of indigenous people were disregarded and they were subjected to a series of policies that were designed to assimilate them into colonial society and culture. Too often, those policies ultimately resulted in poverty, high infant mortality, rampant unemployment, substance abuse, and all its attendant problems. And across the globe, the stories are shockingly similar. When I read Achebe's Things Fall Apart, which chronicled the systematic destruction of an African tribe's social, cultural, and economic structure, it sounded all too familiar. Take the land, discredit the leaders, ridicule the traditional healers and medicine men, take the children and send them off to distant boarding schools. A very familiar story. And I was sickened when I read the report about original, Aboriginal 
uh, children. The report's called Stolen Generation, about Aboriginal children who were, who were forcibly removed for, from their families and placed in boarding schools in Australia. My own father and my aunt Sally were taken, by my grand, taken from my grandfather by the United States government and placed in a government boarding school when they were very, very young. Indigenous people everywhere are connected by our values and by our, our oppression. When contemplating the contemporary challenges and problems faced by indigenous people worldwide, it's important to remember that the roots of many contemporary social, economic, and political problems can be found in colonial policies. And these policies continue today across the globe. In the Amazonian rainforest, indigenous people are continually battling large-scale destruction of their traditional home in the forest by multinational mining, oil, and timber companies. Some small Amazonian indigenous communities are on the verge of extinction as a result of the murder of their leaders and the forced dispersal of their, of their members. And to make matters worse, some well-meaning environmentalists who should be natural allies focus almost exclusively, exclusively, exclusively on the land and appear not to hear or see the people at all. A few years ago, I was in an indigenous community in Brazil, and one of the leaders there said, you know, a few years ago, it was popular to see famous musicians wearing t-shirts that said, save the rainforest. And he said, I never saw anybody wear a t-shirt that said, save the people of the rainforest. Though the people of the forest possess the best knowledge about how to live with and sustain the forest. It's not surprising, really, that the people, indigenous people, are not in the consciousness of many people. There is too little accurate information about indigenous people available in educational institutions, in literature, or films, or in the popular culture. The battle to protect the human and land rights of indigenous people is made immeasurably more difficult by the fact that so few people know much about either the history or contemporary lives of our people. And without any kind of history or cultural context, it's almost impossible for outsiders to understand indigenous issues. This lack of accurate information leaves a void, which is often filled by nonsensical stereotypes which either vilify indigenous people as troubled descendants of savage people, on the one hand, or romanticize them as innocent children of nature, spiritual but incapable of higher thought, on the other hand. Whether they're romanticized or, or vilified, the stereotypes are equally damaging to our children, to our families, and to our people. The stereotypes about indigenous women are particularly appalling. While the role of, of women, in, in, indigenous women in the family and community now and in the past differs from community to community, women have always played very significant roles in tribal society. Yet in the media and in the larger society, the power, strength, and complexity of indigenous women is rarely acknowledged and rarely recognized. I believe that public perceptions about Native people will change in the future. Indigenous leaders are now beginning to understand that there is a direct link between public perception and public policies and that they've got to frame their own issues in the public. If indigenous people don't frame the issues for themselves, their opponents most certainly will. In the future, as more indigenous people become filmmakers, writers, historians, Museum, museum curators and journalists, they'll be able to use a dazzling array of technological tools to tell their own stories, to tell our stories. Once a journalist asked me whether people in the U.S. had trouble accepting the government of the Cherokee Nation during my tenure as principal chief, I was a little surprised by the question. The government of the Cherokee Nation predated the government of the United States, and the Cherokee Nation had treaties with other countries before it executed a treaty with, one of the, one of the, uh, with South Carolina when it was a U.S. colony. 
And during that era, many tribal leaders sent delegations to meet with English, Spanish, and French governmental leaders in an effort to protect their lands and their people. Traveling to foreign lands with a trusted interpreter, tribal ambassadors took maps that had been painstakingly drawn by hand to show their lands to heads of other governments. They also took along gifts, letters, and proclamations. It's painful now to look back at that period in, in history because our tribal leaders thought they were being dealt with as head, heads of state and as equals, but historical records indicate that they were often just merely objects of curiosity or even disdain. The journalist with, journalist with the question about Cherokee government needn't apologize for her lack of knowledge about tribal governments in the U.S. Many people in the U.S. know very little about the history of indigenous people, though they've been living in our former towns and villages for hundreds of years. I'm going to skip some of this history here, because I think you know the history. Tribal governments in the U.S. exercise a range of sovereign rights. Most tribal governments now have their own judicial systems, operate their own police force, run their own schools, administer their own clinics and hospitals, and operate a wide range of business enterprises. There are now over a dozen tribally controlled community colleges, and all these advancements, again, benefit everybody in the community, not just tribal people. One of the most common misperceptions about indigenous people is that we're all the same. And that if you meet one Indian person, then you know about all Indian people. Or that there's some sort of common, quote, Indian language, unquote, that everybody speaks when they get together. But there's not only great diversity between indigenous people, there's great diversity within each tribal community. Members of the Cherokee Nation today are very stratified, stratified culturally, stratified econom economically, stratified racially, and stratified economically in, in every way. While there are some Cherokee people that continue to live close to the land and are fluent in the Cherokee language and close to their culture, there are other Cherokee people that are fully enrolled tribal members that have never even been to the Cherokee Nation. So there's a great deal of cultural uh, stratification. Each indigenous community is unique, just as each community in the larger society is unique. Too many people tend to view indigenous people through a very narrow, one-dimensional lens. Indigenous people need to be viewed with a much wider lens that allows, them, allows us to be seen as complex, multi-dimensional human beings. And we're certainly not getting that from the media. So what does the future hold for indigenous people across the globe? What challenges will they face moving further into the 21st century? I think to see the future of indigenous people around the world, and particularly in this country, one needs only to look at the past. If we have, as a people, been able to survive massacres, war, loss of land, of rights, of resources, and lives, and we're still standing. How can I not be optimistic that whatever challenges that we'll face in the future, that we can survive those as well, and that 200 or 500 years from now, that there will still be viable tribal communities? Without question, the combined efforts of government and various religious groups to eradicate traditional knowledge systems has had a profoundly negative impact on the culture and all, as well as the social and economic systems of indigenous people. But despite all that, we can still hear the languages being spoken. There are still many cultural practices that continue. We've held on to our values and our sense of community and responsibility for one another. So if you think about that for, for a minute, it makes you optimistic about where we're going in the future. And though the, some of the original languages, ceremonies, and knowledge systems have been irretrievably lost, 
the ceremonial fires that many indigenous people across the globe have survived all the up upheaval. Sometimes indigenous communities have almost had to reinvent themselves as a people, but they have never ever given up their sense of responsibility to one another and to the land. It is the sense of interdependence and the values that have sustained tribal people thus far, and I believe it will sustain them well into the future. And the world's changing. But indigenous people know about change and have proven time and time again they can adapt to change. No matter where they go in the world, they still manage to hold on to a st strong sense of tribal identity, even as they fully interact with and participate in the larger society around them. In my state of Oklahoma alone, we produced an in indigenous astronaut, several prima ballerinas, a United States congressman, a Pulit Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, and countless others who have made great contributions to the state and to the world. And yet all of them, to a person, have held on to a strong sense of tribal identity. One of the great challenges for indigenous people in the 21st century will be to figure out a way to develop practical models to capture, maintain, and pass on traditional knowledge systems and values to future generations. There is nothing in the world, nothing, that can replace the sense of continuity and knowing that a genuine understanding of traditional tribal knowledge brings. So we've got to figure out a way to preserve that. Many communities are working on discrete aspects of culture, such as language or medicine, but it's the entire system of knowledge that needs to be maintained, and not just for indigenous people, but for the world at large. Perhaps in the future, indigenous people who have an abiding and deeply held belief that all living things are related and interdependent can help policymakers understand how completely irrational it is to destroy the very natural world that sustains them. Regrettably, in the future, the battle for human and land rights will continue, but the future does look somewhat better. Last year, after 30 years of advocacy by indigenous people, the United Nations finally passed a resolution supporting the rights of indigenous people around the world. The resolution, by the way, was passed over the objections of the United States government as well as the government of Australia. The challenge now will be to make sure that the provisions of the resolution are honored and the rights of indigenous people all over the world are protected. And the efforts of tribal governments to take uh, full advantage of the self-governance and self-determination policies of the United States government are a testament, once again, to the fact that indigenous people simply do better when they have control over their own lives. In the case of my own people, after we were forcibly removed from the, the southeast part of the United States to Indian Territory, in 18, and the last contingent of Cherokees arrived there in April of 1838, we picked ourselves up and rebuilt our families, rebuilt our communities, and rebuilt our nation. We started some of the first schools west of the Mississippi, Indian or non-Indian, and built schools for the higher education of women. We, built, we printed our own newspapers in Cherokee and English, and were more literate than our neighbors in adjoining, the adjoining states of Arkansas and Texas, and probably still are. Yeah. <laughs> Then in the early 20th century, the federal government almost abolished the Cherokee Nation, tried to abolish the Cherokee Nation, and so we had no central functioning uh, Cherokee government from the turn of the century to the early 1970s. And during that time, uh, our educational attainment uh, levels dropped dramatically. In the late 60s, we, our people were living in uh, terrible circumstances with very few amenities. And so if you just look at how we were as a people, prosperous and uh, healthy, whole healthy communities, when we had control and what happened to us when we didn't have control, it once again is a, is a, is a reminder uh, of the importance of our, of our tribal governments. And a couple of years ago, Harvard University completed over a decade of comprehensive research which has been published in a guardedly hopeful book 
entitled A State of Native Nations. The research indicates that most of the social and economic indicators are now moving in a positive direction. Many tribal governments are strong, educational attainment levels are improving, and there is the kind of a cultural renaissance occurring in many tribal communities. Within today, within indigenous communities, there are many conversations about what it means to be an indigenous person now and what it will mean as we move further into the 21st century and, and even further into the future. I am an indigenous woman of the 21st century. To me, being an indigenous woman of the 21st century means that my life has literally played itself out within a set of reciprocal relationships with members of my community and also with members of my family. One of the great gifts of being born an indigenous person is that being born into, being born into a community, a clan, a family, where you know that no matter what happens in your life, someone will be there for you and you'll be there for them. It really is a set of reciprocal relationships. So no matter where you go in the world, you, ha you have that uh, very sense of having a place in the world, having a sense of where you belong. Being an indigenous person in the 21st century means being part of a group of people with the most valuable and ancient knowledge on the planet, of people who still have a direct relationship and sense of, sense of responsibility to the land and to other people. Being an indigenous person of the 21st century means managing to find many moments of grace and comfort and joy in family and traditional stories and language and ceremonies despite an incredible history of oppression and a staggering set of contemporary problems. Being an indigenous person in the 21st century means trusting our own thinking again, believing in ourselves, looking within our communities for solutions to problems, and not only articulating our own vision of the future, but having within our communities the skill sets and leadership ability to make those visions become a reality. Being an indigenous person in the 21st century means that despite everything, we are still able to dream of a future in which all people will support the human rights and self-determination of indigenous people. Land and resources can be colonized and have been colonized, but dreams can never be colonized. Being an indigenous person in the 21st century means sharing traditional knowledge and best practices with indigenous communities all over the world using the iPhone, BlackBerry, MySpace, YouTube, and every other technological tool that becomes available. Being an indigenous person in the 21st century means becoming a physician or a scientist or even an astronaut who will leave her footprints on the moon and then return home to participate in ceremonies her people have had since the beginning of time. To be an indigenous person of the 21st century means to not go around with anger in our heart over past injustice, to acknowledge it and understand it and know it, but to not have anger in our heart over past injustice or become paralyzed into an action by the totality of problems we now face. We've always been advised to keep, keep our eyes fixed firmly on the future. And I, one of my favorite proverbs, which I'll leave you with, is a Mohawk proverb. And uh, they, tell their, they tell their people not to be angry about the past and not to be paralyzed by what's going on in their communities today, but to continually move forward, pick yourself up and keep moving forward. And uh, their proverb is, it's hard to see the future with tears in your eyes. I, I love that proverb. I think it's, it, 
it speaks for all our nations and certainly speaks for, for me personally. So let me leave you with that pr proverb. It's hard to see the future with tears in your eyes. And once again, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.